From Lima, Peru, from the COP20 UN Climate Summit, this is Democracy Now! Some of the uh, tactics uh, that were uh, written about in the Senate Intelligence Report uh, were brutal. And uh, as I've said before, uh, it constituted torture in my mind. And that's not who we are. Waterboarding, rectal feeding, buzzing drills, sexual threats with broom sticks. These are just some of the torture techniques listed in the shocking new Senate investigation of the CIA's post 9 11 interrogation program. We'll speak with Reed Brody of Human Rights Watch, who spent a lifetime trying to bring torturers to justice around the world. Should President Bush and his officials be the next ones prosecuted? Then to the UN Climate Conference here in Lima, Peru. As the world marks International Human Rights Day, we'll look at how Peru has become one of the most dangerous countries in the world for environmentalists. Plus, we'll speak to Nigerian environmental leader Nemo Bassi and to Brazilian indigenous leader Chief Ninoa Hunikwe. Corporations that are polluting and destroying nature. Indigenous peoples protect Mother Earth. We defend our mother because she is our mother, because she gives us food. She gives us the air that we breathe. She gives us the Amazon. And the Amazon is important not just for indigenous peoples, it's important for the whole world. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from Lima, Peru. The release of the U.S. Senate findings on the post-9-11 U.S. torture program has sparked shock and outrage over the CIA's abuses and renewed calls for the prosecution of the officials who authorized and carried them out. The Senate report details a list of torture methods used on prisoners, waterboarding, sexual abuse with broomsticks, rectal feeding or rectal hydration. Prisoners were threatened with buzzing power drills. Some captives were deprived of sleep for up to 180 hours, at times with their hands shackled above their heads. The torture was carried out at black sites in Afghanistan, in Lithuania, Romania, Poland, Thailand, and a secret site on the Guantanamo naval base, known as Strawberry Fields. Speaking on the Senate floor, the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Senator Dianne Feinstein, said the report forces the U.S. to say, never again. There are those who will seize upon the report and say, see what the Americans did, and they will try to use it to justify evil actions or incite <laughs> more violence. We can't prevent that. but. History will judge us by our commitment to a just society governed by law and the willingness to face an ugly truth and say never again. The report concludes the CIA failed to disrupt a single plot despite torturing al-Qaeda and other captives in secret prisons worldwide between 2002 and 2006. CIA officials were also found to have routinely misled the media, Congress, and the White House on the torture methods and their ineffectiveness. In response to the report, President Obama said the findings underscore why he ended the torture program after taking office. Some of the uh, tactics uh, that were uh, written about in the Senate Intelligence Report uh, were brutal. And uh, as I've said before, uh, it constituted torture in my mind, and that's not who we are. And so, uh, although I am concerned about uh, potential ramifications overseas, and we've taken precautionary steps uh, to try to mitigate uh, any additional risks, uh, I think it, it was important for us to uh, release this so that we can uh, count for it so that people understand precisely why I banded these practices as one of the first acts I took when I came into office, uh, and uh, hopefully make sure that we don't make those mistakes again. While President Obama ended the torture program, he's long rejected calls to prosecute the officials involved. 
In a statement Wednesday, Obama maintained his stance, calling on the nation not to refight old arguments. Major human rights groups, including Human Rights Watch, are again calling for President Bush and other administration officials to face investigation. We'll have more on this story after headlines. Congressional lawmakers have finalized a spending bill to avoid a government shutdown before the Thursday deadline. The $1.1 trillion measure will fund all government agencies through September, except for the Department of Homeland Security, whose allocation expires in February. That will let Republicans challenge President Obama's execution action, granting a reprieve to up to 5 million undocumented immigrants. The bill also includes cuts to retiree benefits at some multi-employer pension plans, sparking criticism from advocates. In a victory for Republicans, the Environmental Protection Agency will lose $60 million in funding and its workforce reduced to its lowest level in 25 years. A House vote is expected on Thursday. Protests have continued in New York City for a seventh straight night since a grand jury decision not to indict a police officer for the death of Eric Garner. On Tuesday, demonstrators staged a die-in inside Grand Central Station, laying on the ground, simulating choking and chanting Garner's last words, I can't breathe. The people that's fighting just walk away. Are you serious? I didn't do nothing. It stops. It stops today. A group of high school students staged a walkout, marching to the Brooklyn Office of Federal Prosecutors and Attorney General nominee Loretta Lynch to demand federal intervention. A group of young black activists have organized what they're calling a Millions March in New York City as part of the National Day of Action on Saturday. Meanwhile, protests against police killings of unarmed African Americans continue nationwide. In Phoenix, about 200 people rallied over the most recent victim, 34-year-old Rumaine Brisbane. Police shot Brisbane last week after mistaking a pill bottle in his pocket for a gun. At the march, protesters remembered Brisbane and demanded justice over his death. First and foremost, he's a family man, um, definitely there for his kids, loving, caring, a very good friend to everyone. I'm out here for justice for Lumaine, I'm out here for justice for all minorities. I'm out here just to like be heard, I'm out here to stand with Phoenix. We're not going to stand for them murdering people. Um, I mean, people are unarmed when they're being murdered right now. They have no reason to... Um, to be even following him. He was racially profiled, and that is a huge problem in Arizona. The rally was led by Brisbane's nine-year-old daughter, one of his four children. The United Nations says it's received pledges from 28 countries to take in over 100,000 Syrian refugees. The announcement follows a U.N. plea for Western countries to open their doors to more of Syria's 3.2 million displaced people. U.N. High Commissioner for Refugees Antonio Guterres unveiled the pledges on Tuesday. Today, 28 countries express their solidarity with the Syrian refugees, but also with the, the five neighboring countries that are hosting them, Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, and Egypt, offering uh, what we estimate will be more than 100,000 opportunities for resettlement and humanitarian admission. Of these, we had 66,254 firm, concrete pledges. The U.N. World Food Program has also resumed food aid to over 1.7 million Syrian refugees after a funding shortfall forced it to suspend deliveries earlier this month. An emergency fundraising drive netted over $80 million. Iraq has asked the Obama administration for more airstrikes and military aid to, the comb to combat the Islamic State. Speaking during a visit to Baghdad, outgoing Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel said the request will be considered. His um, specific uh, request regarding uh, additional firepower uh, was one we did discuss, and I appreciated uh, his directness uh, in that discussion. 
Um, we talked about how, in fact, and he noted this, uh, the United States uh, has accelerated uh, many of the weapon systems that uh, and the platforms that Iraq uh, will need and continue to, uh, to require, like Hellfire missiles over the last few months. We've put all that on a fast track. The Iraqi government request for more airstrikes comes as the Obama administration's asked Congress for broad authority to attack the Islamic State anywhere in the world. Testifying before a Senate panel, Secretary of State John Kerry said Tuesday that any congressional measure to authorize U.S. military force on ISIS should not limit the campaign to Iraq and Syria. Kerry also says the measure should not prevent Obama from deploying combat troops, if need be. A Palestinian minister has died after a confrontation with Israeli troops at a West Bank protest. Ziad Abu Ayn, the head of the Palestinian Authority's Anti-Wall and Settlement Commission, was taking part in an action against the separation wall when Israeli soldiers reportedly assaulted him. Witnesses say he collapsed after being head-butted and hit in the chest, then died after inhaling large amounts of tear gas. He was 55 years old. George has executed a death row prisoner after his last-minute appeal was denied. Robert Wayne Holsey was convicted of murdering a police officer in 1997. Defense lawyers had filed a challenge on the basis of Holsey's original attorney was drinking up to a quart of vodka a day during his murder trial. They argued the lawyer failed to present evidence that could have helped his client's case, including a traumatizing childhood and an intellectual deficit that bordered on disability. And the Obama administration has unveiled new limits on racial profiling by federal law enforcement agencies. For the first time, the FBI will no longer be able to claim a Bush-era exemption for racial profiling in cases deemed to concern national security. The rules also expand the definition of illegal profiling to include religion, national origin, gender, and sexual orientation. But they contain major exemptions, including for Department of Homeland Security agents at airports and border checkpoints. A number of controversial tactics will also remain in place, including the mapping of ethnic communities and using that information to launch probes and recruit informants. The rules do not apply to local or state law enforcement agencies, just as their tactics come under wide security scrutiny over racial profiling. And the former president of the corporation that contaminated drinking water in West Virginia earlier this year has been arrested on charges of criminal fraud. Gary Southerns accused of bankruptcy fraud, wire fraud, lying under oath during Freedom Industries bankruptcy proceedings following the spill. Prosecutors say Southern developed a scheme to shield himself from lawsuits and protect his personal fortune from liability claims. More than 300,000 West Virginians were left without drinking water, and dozens were hospitalized after Freedom Industries spilled a coal-cleaning chemical into the Elk River. And the Pakistani education activist Malala Yousafzai and Indian child rights activist Kailash Satyarthi have been jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize today. At age 17, Malala Yousafzai is the youngest person ever to win a Nobel Prize. In 2012, she was shot in the head by a Taliban gunman who boarded her school bus. She survived and continued to campaign for the rights of girls to go to school. Satyarthi, age 60, has been a leader for decades in the international movement against child slavery and the exploitation of child workers. At a ceremony in Oslo today, both laureates were honored as champions of peace. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Graphic new details of the post-9-11 U.S. torture program came to light Tuesday, when the Senate Intelligence Committee released a 500-page summary of its investigation into the CIA. The report concluded the intelligence agency failed to disrupt a single plot despite torturing al-Qaeda and other captives in secret prisons worldwide between 2002 and 2006. Senator Dianne Feinstein, chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, outlined the report's key findings. First, the CIA's enhanced interrogation techniques were not an effective way to gather intelligence information. Second. The CIA provided extensive amounts of inaccurate information 
about the operation of the program and its effectiveness to the White House, the Department of Justice, Congress, the CIA Inspector General, the media, and the American public. Third, the CIA's management of the program was inadequate and deeply flawed. And fourth, the CIA program was far more brutal than people were led to believe. The Senate report details a list of torture methods used on prisoners, waterboarding, sexual threats with broomsticks, medically unnecessary rectal feeding. In one case, a prisoner had his entire lunch tray of hummus, pasta and nuts pureed and administered by enema. Prisoners were threatened with buzzing power drills. Some captives were deprived of sleep for up to 180 hours, at times with their hands shackled above their heads. Speaking on the floor of the Senate Tuesday, Senator Feinstein discussed the death of Ghul Rahman at a CIA black site north of Kabul, Afghanistan, known as the Salt Pit. The CIA placed a junior officer with no relevant experience in charge of the site. In November 2002, an otherwise healthy detainee who was being held mostly nude and chained to a concrete floor, died at the facility from what is believed to have been hypothermia. In interviews conducted in 2003 by the CIA officer of the Inspector General, CIA's leadership acknowledged that they had little or no awareness of operations at this specific CIA detention site. Senator Feinstein discussing the death of Ghul Rahman. The Senate report also reveals Rahman was only detained due to mistaken identity. In another case, a detainee named Abu Hudaifa was subjected to ice water baths and 66 hours of standing sleep deprivation before being released because the CIA discovered he was likely not the person he was believed to be. According to the Senate report, the CIA ran black sites in Afghanistan, in Lithuania, Romania, Poland, Thailand, and a secret site at the Guantanamo Naval Base, known as Strawberry Fields. The Senate report, released Tuesday, is just the summary of a much longer investigation into CIA's torture practices. Key parts of the summary were redacted. The names of two psychologists who helped the CIA create the torture program are not included in the summary. The report does detail that the psychologists, whose names are James Mitchell and Bruce Jessen, received an $81 million contract from the CIA. So far, no one involved in the CIA interrogation program has been charged with a crime, with one exception, the whistleblower John Kiriakou. In 2007, he became the first person with direct knowledge of the program to publicly reveal its existence. He's currently serving a 30-month sentence. For more on the Senate torture report, we're joined by Reed Brody, counsel and spokesperson for Human Rights Watch. He's written several reports for Human Rights Watch on prisoner mistreatment in the war on terror, including a 2011 report which called for a criminal investigation of senior Bush administration officials. Reed, since I'm speaking to you from Lima, Peru, where the U.N. Climate Summit is happening and you're in New York and there's a satellite delay, if you could just lay out the most critical points that um, have come out in this, again, just the summary, not the actual thousands of pages that are still uh, classified, but the remarkable revelations in this summary that has been released by the Senate Intelligence Committee. Sure, Amy. Um... As you say, the, f the first thing that really uh, jumps out is, is, is just the sheer pervasiveness of, uh, of the brutality. I mean, even those of us who have been looking at this for the last 10 years, um, as one of my colleagues said, maybe not surprised, but, but shocked. Um, you know, you describe uh, the rectal feeding, the rectal hydration. Um, you know, this was not just one prisoner. This was a number of prisoners, and, and they were used, um, according to the CIA documents, as a means of behavior control. I mean, this is, this is you know, an IV infusion um, placed up somebody's rectum. Um, in a, the person is in a forward-facing position, their head lower than their torso, at which point you put in a rectal tube. Um, 
with an IV, um, the flow will regulate sloshing up the large intestines. You put up the tube as large as you can, then you open the IV wide. No need to squeeze the bag, let gravity do uh, the work. Um, and this was not, you know, this is rape. I mean, this is the CIA um, discussing in emails um, and, and documents, um, you know, the methods they are using to rape um, uh, 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 detainees. Um, a detainee who died uh, in, in the salt pit in Afghanistan, who was partially nude and chained to a concrete floor, who died from suspected hypothermia. Um, uh, at least three de detainees were um, uh, uh, threatened with harm to their families, uh, threats to the children of detainees, threats to sexually abuse the mother of a detainee. A detainee told that he would never be allowed to leave alive. Uh, detainees placed in ice water baths, um, people shackled uh, in dark cells, um, no, called by, by the CIA's own people, referred to as a dungeon. I mean, this is this is this is medieval stuff, um, and you know, it it, it really. Uh, uh, it, it, it really, sh it, it's, re I have to say, it's really shocking, even, even, even for me. Um, as you mentioned, um, this was a dysfunctional program. Uh, the, uh, the interrogation program was essentially outsourced um, to these two psychologists um, who you mentioned. Um, and, and neither psychologist had any experience as an interrogator. They had no specialized knowledge of uh, al-Qaeda, no background in counterterrorism uh, or any relevant uh, linguistic or cultural information. And as you pointed out, they received $81 million, and these contractors um, made up 85 percent, or their company that they created um, and, and other contractors made up 85 percent of the workforce um, for these detainee operations. Now, at the same time, um, that it was run amok, there, there was a culture, and this is important to understand, of just, you know, let them loose. Um, on a number of occasions, uh, there were complaints, um, there were uh, things went up to headquarters, uh, and the word that came back was, look, we'd rather be safe than sorry. And um, in one case, uh, a, no action was taken against the CIA officer for wrongful detention um, because, quote, the director strongly believes that mistakes should be expected in a business filled with uncertainty. Uh, the director believes that the scales tip decisively in favor of accepting mistakes that overconnect the dots rather than underconnect them. Even in the case of the death uh, from hypo suspected hypothermia that we talked about, uh, headquarters decided not to take action um, because they were motivated uh, be, uh, to extract any and all operational information. Um, you pointed out, I think, probably the key uh, thing being discussed in Washington today is the, uh, the conclusion that no actionable intelligence that could not have been uh, garnered by other means uh, were, 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 were extracted through this program. And, and the committee went through 20 incidents in which CIA claimed um, to have garnered actionable intelligence that was used to, to capture people or to, to foil plots. And in each of those 20 incidents, um, the committee found uh, either that uh, the uh, intelligence already existed, um, that it wasn't used, um, or that the plot, in fact, didn't exist. And, and, you know, people particularly focus on the capture of Osama bin Laden and the identification of the courier um, who led uh, who led the U.S. to Osama bin Laden. And, and the committee found um, that the vast majority of the intelligence about the Qaeda courier, quote, was originally acquired from sources unrelated to the CIA detention and interrogation program. And the most accurate information acquired from a CIA detainee was provided prior to the CIA subjecting the detainee to enhanced interrogation techniques. Um, another thing we see here constantly is the desire to evade the law. Um, you referred to, and, and Diane Feinstein, in, in, in what I found to be a remarkable speech on the Senate floor, 
um, referred to um, the lies. Um, but there are a lot of little tidbits um, that we find in this report. For instance, you mentioned there was, in addition to the black sites in foreign countries, there was a black site at Guantanamo. Um, but in the 2004, the Supreme Court in the Hamdan ruling basically said the Constitution applies in Guantanamo. And at that point, uh, the, the detainees who were in Guantanamo were shipped out of Guantanamo. Um, and uh, this is the CIE detainees, of course. And they were sent to Morocco. Um, and actually, what, what's interesting uh, tidbit in the report is that they were actually placed in a Moroccan jail, as opposed to the other countries where they were placed in, in CIA facilities. And, and uh, the problem was that they heard Mor they, they were so close to the Moroccan prisoners that they could hear the Moroccan prisoners um, uh, screaming. Um, in, the, in the other cases, uh, uh, in, in Thailand, Afghanistan, Poland, Romania, um, the, uh, the CIA detention centers were far away uh, from—they I mean, they were, they were CIA detention centers. Um, uh, what is interesting in this report, too, about those centers is the kind of the diplomatic cost um, of having uh, CIA detention centers in, in other countries. Often, the ambassadors uh, to those countries were not informed or were only informed after the deal was done. Um, uh, the, in order to, to basically buy the cooperation of these countries, uh, uh, the U.S. had to offer them wish lists um, uh, and, and uh, uh, of what they wanted. Uh, in one very interesting uh, note in the report, and it shows the kind of the perverse effect of having a CIA detention center, um, the Secretary of State in 2004 ordered a U.S. ambassador in an unnamed country uh, to demarche the country um, to ask that that country provide for its prisons um, full access to the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross. But, of course, the problem was, at the same time, the U.S. had prisoners in that country who it was keeping secret and obviously not um, uh, uh, available um, to the Red Cross. Um, final and, and probably most important point is, I guess, what is not in this report. Um, this report, you know, deals with one aspect of one part of the detainee uh, mistreatment in the war on terror. Um, it deals with the CIA uh, prisoners held uh, in black sites. Um, it does not, for instance, deal with renditions uh, by the CIA. So there's no mention in here of the CIA sending prisoners um, to places like Syria under Bashir al-Assad, um, where people like Maher Arar, who has been on your show several times, um, was tortured. It does not talk about people being sent to Libya. Uh, under Muammar Gaddafi's intelligence agencies, um, where they were tortured. Um, it does not talk about people being sent to Egypt. Um, and, and it doesn't talk about what the Pentagon was doing. It doesn't talk about the programs approved by Donald Rumsfeld. Um, and, and probably more importantly, by focusing everything on the CIA, um, it tends to kind of let off the hook um, all those people above who authorize these programs. So we know, and from President Bush's own uh, memoirs, um, that he authorized uh, waterboarding. Um, Vice President Dick Cheney, um, Attorney General John Ashcroft, uh, White House Counsel Alberto Gonzalez, um, these are all people who signed off on, on the authorization of um, these techniques, not to mention the lawyers. Um, people like John Yu and Jay Bybee, um, who uh, gave the legal authorization uh, for this. Um, earlier, you had President Obama's uh, uh, remarks, in which he said uh, that it was important uh, that this report be made public so that, hopefully, uh, we won't make these mistakes again. Um, these aren't mistakes. Um, these are crimes. And, um, you know, Dianne Feinstein, in, in, in her Senate remarks, referred to the U.N. Convention Against Torture, uh, which says that torture can never be justified under any circumstances. Well, that convention says something else. It says that torture must be prosecuted, that when someone is alleged to have committed torture, 
uh, the, the state concern must uh, refer that case to their competent authorities for the purpose of prosecution. Um, what assurance um, do we have that this is not going to happen again? Um, you know, it's not enough, again, to say, well, we tortured some folks, this was a bad uh, policy choice, I'm going to put a stop to the torture. Um, uh, you know, it is not a policy choice again. It is a crime. And there needs to be, if, if, if this is really going to be, um, if there is really going to be any deterrence uh, for this not happening again, um, there needs to be prosecutions. And it's wonderful, you know, in, you've talked about, uh, you know, human rights watches work around the world. Um, human rights organizations regularly, when countries commit torture, uh, when individuals commit torture, uh, we call on those countries to hold the abusers to account. And uh, that has to be the same thing uh, for the United States. Um, uh, we believe, as you mentioned, and, and, and we're not the only ones, the United Nations has said the same, uh, Amnesty International has said the same, um, that there, there is a case to answer uh, for senior U.S. leaders um, for, on charges of, of, of torture, for the, not for the things in this report and for the wider um, authorizations that they gave um, for torture and war crimes to be committed. Reed Brody, I want to thank you very much for being with us. Reed Brody is counsel and spokesperson for Human Rights Watch. He's written several reports for Human Rights Watch on prisoner mistreatment and the war on terror. And we will link to the latest uh, executive summary of the Senate report that has been released. And of course, we'll be bringing you more on this in the days to come. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report. We're broadcasting from Lima, Peru, where the UN Climate Summit is taking place. When we come back, we'll be joined by one of the leading environmentalists in the world, Numo Vasi of Nigeria. Stay with us. Musicians who performed yesterday at the opening ceremony of the UN Climate Summit. They were just practicing in the walkways here um, in Pentagonito. Uh, that is the site, the very well fortified site where this UN Climate Summit is happening. So many of the citizen actions happening miles away from here. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Yes, we are broadcasting from the UN Climate Summit, where high-level talks got underway Tuesday during the opening ceremony that included performances by Peruvian dancers and musicians. Bolivian President Evo Morales called on the delegates to include the wisdom of indigenous people in the global agreement to address climate change. During a later news conference, Morales criticized the UN Summit for failing to address the root of the crisis. Sometimes in this type of event, uh, official event, uh, where governments are represented, uh, the deep causes of global warming are not dealt with. We only remain at the effects of uh, global warming. 
And uh, we are convinced as uh, the plurinational state of Bolivia that represents the different social movements of Bolivia, that the origin of global warming lies in capitalism. If we could uh, end capitalism, and this is something we should do at global level, we would have a solution. This is why it's so important to integrate our peoples. The U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon also addressed the U.N. Climate Conference on Tuesday. He took questions from the press after his speech. Mike Burke from Democracy Now! in New York. Uh, over the past year, many churches, uh, investment funds and schools have joined a movement to divest from fossil fuel companies. And I'm wondering if you support this movement. It's encouraging these days that uh, there is a great awareness and the willingness uh, that uh, they are now investing their resources into more sustainable energy. Of course, you know, practically speaking, in our real world, this uh, fossil fuel may have to continue uh, to be used as our energy sources. To talk more about the state of the climate talks, we're joined right now here in Lima, Peru, by Nemo Bassi, Nigerian environmental activist, director of the Health and Mother Health of Mother Earth Foundation. He's the author of To Cook a Continent: Destructive Extraction and Climate Crisis in Africa. How is this climate summit going? It is the 20th climate summit. It's called COP20. Uh, next year, the binding summit. Do you hold out any hope, Nemo? Uh, unfortunately, I, I would like to be hopeful. I'm an incredible optimist, but with regard to the Conference of Parties on Climate Change, I, I believe that uh, there was a big derailment right from Copenhagen at COP15. So um, there, there's no real reason to think there's going to be something that we can say, yes, finally, the world is on track to tackle global warming. Uh, we, we're still seeing situations where nations are haggling and debating over figures, nothing to show that there is an understanding that climate change is something that has been scientifically investigated and that there must be a way to evaluate aggregate actions by different countries that would add up to a result that would tackle the problem. Right from the arrival of the Copenhagen Accord, everything is moving in terms of the direction of voluntary commitments to, to reduce emissions. As President Evo Morales, Morales said, there's really no, no indication that the world, the leading nations, the rich nations of this world are ready to tackle global warming as source. What is causing global warming? One of the major causes is the dependence on fossil fuels. And all the conservative organizations like the World Bank, the International Energy Agency have all indicated that unless up to 80 percent of known fossil fuels reserves are left under the ground, we are on track for catastrophic temperature increase. And this is, there's no talk about leaving fossil fuels. Everything is about how to offset the pollution. So every mechanism is being developed that would help polluting industry and rich countries to continue with business as usual. Nemo, can you talk about the effects of climate change on Africa and particularly Nigeria? Well, the effect of climate change is real, is real already being experienced. It's not something for the future. And Africa is so central in the whole of this because uh, Africa experiences 50 percent more in terms of temperature rise than the global average. So if the global average temperature goes up by 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, in Africa the experience will be 3 degrees Celsius. If it goes to 6 degrees, that will be 9 degrees. Africa is set to be roasted. We're going to a scenario where we may have Africa without Africans. It's really horrible. The floods are getting more, the droughts, the desertification. Africa may well be the only continent where the desert is still spreading. And then with the assault on land grabs and everything, we are really being squeezed. In 2012, we had floods across the continent. In my country, Nigeria, uh, 6 million people were displaced by flooding in one year. Uh, over 300 lost their lives. Uh, we had similar, similar flooding replicated across the continent. Uh, we, we're having also the, the, the challenge of sea level rise. Uh, we are come from the Niger Delta, the land is naturally subsiding. And so when you have a combination of sea level rise and, and land subsidence, you're having a heightened impact. 
We are seeing a situation also from research that if the situation continues the way it's going, by 2050, we may well have more than 50 degree, 50 percent increase on conflict on the continent. I mean, this is something I don't even want to think about, considering the level of resource conflict, political conflict, and other manifestations of violence on the continent. Can you explain what RED is, <clears throat> what it stands for, and what it means for the African continent? Well, RED is a mechanism uh, that has been introduced in the... R-E-D-D. -D. Okay. <laughs> RED is reducing emissions for deforestation and forest degradation. That's what it's meant to mean. That's what it. I mean, it's a it's, it's a concept that nobody will really oppose. But when you look at the practice on the ground, it's just a carbon market mechanism where polluting industries and rich nations, instead of stopping pollution at source, would secure and buy up forest in Africa, in Latin America, somewhere else, and even some forests in the global north, so as to permit them. To pollute. Red is a mechanism that permits the polluter to continue polluting. And so explain how it works. For example, the state of California can um, invest in an area in Brazil, which we're going to talk about in a minute, in Acre. Um, and what happens to that area? So then California can pollute further. But what are they doing in Brazil? Well, what they would do in Brazil is that the forest would be, the, the forest dependent communities would now be more or less displaced from having access to the forest, our forest resources, and also their, their territories. If I take this back to Africa, right now we speak, the displacement of communities in the same, of the Sengua people in Kenya, uh, who have been displaced from their forest because red projects about to set in there. We, we've had displacement of thousands in Uganda already. In Nigeria, my own country, uh, the Cross River Forest, this part of it is being secured for red projects. So people are forced out of their communities? Uh, essentially, this is happening. People are being forced out with military power, military might, so as to secure carbon. Forest trees are being seen as carbon stocks, not as trees anymore. Uh, and and this, the, the fearful thing is that uh, with the discussions in red, this may move on to issues of not just carbon in trees, but carbon in agriculture. So farmers will be farming carbon rather than growing food for, for, for people to eat. And unfortunately also for the United Nations, a forest is a forest, a plantation is accepted as a forest. So red is set to kind of accelerate plantations across across the tropical world. And this would mean more displacements of communities, more displacement of farmers from farming land, and of course, it's going to compound the food crisis in the region. Well, Nemo Bassi, I want to thank you for being with us. Nemo Bassi is a Nigerian environmental activist and the director of health of Mother Earth Foundation. We'll be speaking to him more later in the week. He's the author of To Cook a Continent, Destructive Extraction and Climate Crisis in Africa. As we turn now um, for to the late Nigerian environmentalist Ken Sarawiwa, uh, who was executed in 1995. Um, before we go, the significance, um, nine, what, 19 years later, of Ken Sarawiwa, who fought for the Agoni people in Nigeria. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, let me prefer by saying that Ken Sarawiwa actually inspired me to become committed to environmental justice activism. So 20 years down the, almost 20 years down the line since the execution, I'm glad to say that the Ogoni people and the peoples of the Niger Delta where all this, all degradation has gone on for over 50 years, the people are more resolute than ever and they're demanding that their lands be cleaned up. Now for the Ogoni people, three years ago, United Nations Environment Program issued an assessment of the Ogoni environment and validated everything Ken Sarawiwa stood for and fought for. Uh, kind of indicating that what we have in Ogoni land is nothing short of ecocide, destruction of Mother Earth, a kind of destruction that is almost irreversible. Now, you never found pollution in some places, many places in Ogoni land that has gone as deep as five meters into the ground, hydrocarbon pollution. The water is found to have benzene, which causes cancer, up to 900 times above World Health Organization standard. But three years after this report, 
there's been very little movement, unfortunately, by the Nigerian government and by Shell, who has been the major polluter in the region. Nima Bassi, thanks so much. Uh, as we turn right now to the controversial carbon trading that he was talking about, known as RED, again, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, REDD, which has set off protests not only in Africa, but also in South America, especially in the Amazon. Earlier this week, I interviewed Chief Ninua Hunikui, president of the Federation of the Hunikui, an indigenous group in Brazil. He traveled to Lima to voice his opposition to RED. My name is Ninawa, and I am the president of the Federation of the Hunikui people in Acre, Brazil, in the Brazilian Amazon. And how many people do you represent? Uh, there is I represent 10,400 people in 90 villages, in two indigenous territories, in five provinces of the state of Acre in the Brazilian Amazon. Can you talk about why you've come to Lima for the UN Climate Summit? What is your message? Creio que eu vim para este local. I came to Lima to, uh, with the hope of telling the world that the uh, historic discussions here at COP20 amongst the 195 countries and indigenous people of the world and uh, civil society of the world on climate change are historic. Que vem para fazer essa discussão sobre as mudanças climáticas. E também porque dentre esses. Of course, the peoples of the world include indigenous peoples of the world, and we are here to denounce the problems that the governments are causing in our territories. O governo decide o futuro dos territórios desses povos indígenas. My message is from my people and the children and elders of my community, and we are saying that the climate change proposals that the government is tabling here at the United Nations are false solutions to climate change. Specifically, we are here to denounce RED. R-E-D-D, -D, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. How does RED affect your community? Uh, o estado do Acre foi o primeiro... So the first impact is that the state of Acre is one of the first uh, states in the world that is promoting RED, and it is the first state of the Brazilian Amazon that is doing RED. And it, it has already violated Convention 169 of the International Labor Organization, which guarantees indigenous people's right to free prior informed consent and the right to say no to projects that affect us. Yes. So Brazil is violating Convention 169 because indigenous peoples have not been consulted about RED, and it is moving forward. So the second impact of RED is that it has divided indigenous leaders who before were united to defend the territories in Mother Earth. A third impact of RED is that it has resulted in the co-optation of some leaders who have accepted money and bought cars with that money, um, and they don't even know where that money is from and, and what it means. A uh, outro impacto que o governo brasileiro Another impact is that the government of Brazil, because it is opening its doors to this carbon offset mechanism, um, is that it's gutting the laws and the legal framework on indigenous people's rights and the guarantees that have been enshrined to protect our rights to our territories. Can you talk about the effect on the ground of RED? What happens in your community when it's enforced? Um dos impactos que causou nesses projetos para ser implementado foi a 
impacts are the following. Um, the community is no longer to fish in their own land, um, to uh, cultivate food, to practice agriculture. Da agricultura de subsistência, hoje eles são proibidos de fazer uh, esses, essas All of these activities are banned and have been declared illegal, and people are jailed if they participate in agriculture or go fishing. Purus, né, no município de Manuel Urbano, no estado do Acre. Outro impacto que é So another impact that is a very cruel impact of red pilot projects is that leaders are being criminalized for opposing the project, and the communities are told that the services provided for education or transportation or health care will be suspended if they oppose. Transport, é, estrada que não vai ter saúde, atendimento de saúde para essas famílias que é, negam a, em aceitar o projeto de rede nas suas comunidades. What are the communities expected to do? Are they given the money to move? Uh, na verdade, hoje já acontece. Uh, the truth Acre, of what is happening Acre in Acre is that there is now a, a program uh, that pays uh, the community. The program is called Bolsa Floresta, and uh, a family gets 300 reais for three months, which isn't enough to live on. And then they're banned and prohibited for going into the forest so that the government can sell carbon credits to multinational corporations in other parts of the world to offset. That their pollution. Have you been offered money? Sim, a o governo do Acre com Yes, um, the government of Acre uh, offered two million reais to my community. Uh, they said it was to uh, motivate uh, strengthening our culture, but we understood it as a precursor to uh, winning the acceptance of signing a red contract. Então a minha comunidade não aceitou esse projeto. And who are the corporations and the um, government entities, uh, states in the United States that are doing this in Brazil? Uh, as, uh, there are many actors that are promoting uh, RED in Acre and that have given money to the state of Acre to do RED. Uh, one of them is the state of California in the United States, but there are also multinational corporations that are offering money to uh, uh, Acre government to do RED. And um, in August of 2014, uh, Germany gave the government of Acre uh, 280 million reais to do red. Milhões de reais para o mecanismo de rede no estado do Acre. Ninua, you talked about the criminalization of leaders who oppose red. You're a leader who opposes red. Have you been threatened? Ah, uh, sim. Não só eu como vários Yes, uh, I have received threats, but not. I'm not the only one who's received threats. Uh, leaders of the Mandoruku, uh, indigenous people, have also received threats for resisting red, and other uh, peoples and leaders are persecuted and criminalized, and our right and freedom of expression and of association and our freedom to struggle and to resist this and to oppose it is being violated. Um, I myself have have denounced Sobre red and have também. also received death threats. Finally, Ninua, what do you say to those that say this is an environmental solution, that if corporations or states or countries are going to pollute, that they want to invest in places that remain pristine, that are not polluted? No Brasil, o que eu digo para as pessoas So que I isso é respond to those é solução, that say that it's a solution that red is not a solution to climate change. It is a false no solution to Brasil, climate change. Um and furthermore, indigenous peoples are not the ones that are causing climate change. In Brazil, China, in Mato Grosso, então, you know, the biggest soy baron is receiving matar. funding uh, and subsidies então, from the Brazilian government 
government to cut down the forests. This is not a solution to climate change. And furthermore, Red is criminalizing us. And really, if they care about real solutions, they've got to talk to the logging companies, the soy barons, the, the corporations that are polluting and destroying nature. Indigenous peoples protect Mother Earth. We defend our mother because she is our mother, because she gives us food. She gives us the air that we breathe. She gives us the Amazon. And the Amazon is important not just for indigenous peoples. It's important for the whole world. That was Nina Wa Huni Kui, president of the Huni Kui people in Acre, Brazil, as he sings us through our break. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in Lima, Peru. As we end today's show, protesters are gathering downtown Lima for what organizers hope will be the largest climate march in the history of South America. On Tuesday, Democracy Now! visited the Tierra Activa convergence space that's become a key organizing hub ahead of the march. Hi, my name is Mahandra Rodriguez. I'm part of Tierra Activa Peru. Uh, we're, along with Tierra Activa Bolivia, running this convergence space called Casa Activa, or the Tierra Activa Convergence House. Um, this is a temporary location for local groups and also international groups, activists, artists, cultural groups, youth, um, citizens, activists in general to come, gather, uh, learn from each other, exchange experiences. We have uh, workshop spaces, meeting spaces. We also have art making spaces. We have an alternative uh, community radio space here in this house as well. So the idea is to, uh, for people to come, to exchange, and also to prepare actions, specifically focusing on the march tomorrow, which is Wednesday 10th, um, which is hoping, we're, we're hoping it's going to be um, the biggest climate rally in Latin America um, in history. Um, and so we're preparing very much for that. My name is Nikki Scordelis, and I'm here with the uh, Tierra Activa movement from Bolivia. And uh, we're jointly running this space with Tierra Activa Peru. Well, we see that climate change is, is a result of a system problem. So we're trying to build alternatives that really confront the whole system, you know, starting from how we live as people. So for us, a really key point is about community. And we're trying to live together in this house, both those who are actually living here and others who are coming and working here every day. And we're trying to find you know, ways of collaborating, ways of understanding each other, where you know, sharing so many people in this space. We're also working a lot with food as a real alternative. We have this project called Conscious Food, which is all about eating food, which basically is rejecting the you know, transnational companies, um, GMOs, you know, all the uh, like chemicals, and we're trying to eat organic, natural foods, vegetarian food with less environmental impacts. Uh, we're doing this as a community kitchen every day. We're running with lunch and dinner. As, as also, it's a way of bringing everyone together around community. Bueno, me llamo Ariel de la Rocha. My name is Ariel de la Rocha from Bolivia. I'm from the movement called Conscious Food. So the movement of Conscious Food began with a group of us climate change activists realizing the relationship between decisions we made about food and its impact on climate change. With our activism around climate change, we started to distribute more healthy food and put aside food products that emit more greenhouse gases. In this sense, we started to be involved with this house and part of the Active Earth Bolivia movement and to initiate actions around the COP and the People's Summit. Voices from the Tierra Activa Convergence Space here in Lima, Peru. Tune in tomorrow for coverage of today's Climate March. Democracy Now! is produced by a remarkable crew. Mike Burke, Renee Feltz, Aramate, Nermi Sheikh, Steve Martinez, Semak, Hani Masood, Rabbi Karen, Dina Guzder, Amy Littlefield, Dennis Monahan, Clara Barra, Andres, Contreras, John Hamilton, and Chuck Scourge. Special thanks to Julie Crosby. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.